Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are speaking with filmmaker and activist, recent director of Planet of the Humans, Jeff Gibbs. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me on the on the show. Uh, Indiana, Michigan, you know, it's a good combination. Where are you at in uh, Michigan, Jeff? I'm in a secure, undisclosed location. Well, I was going to say, maybe we don't. <laughs> no, I'm in uh, now a bit south southwest of Traverse City, um, just in a rural area, not too far from the National Park. Okay. We're in yeah, Northwest Indiana, here. Michigan City. So we're right on the border with you. We often travel into Southwest Michigan, like Sawyer and Three Oaks and uh, that sort of area. And you're on Central Time? We are on Central Time. Yeah, see, I can never get that straight down there. I know. But, uh, <laughs> we're in the little yeah, I'm corner. under a big, tall cottonwood tree here. And, uh, um, you know, and I'm looking out at some trees. Um, there's ash trees that are not doing well, but there's an ash tree that I um, revived by putting my compost pile underneath it. And I, I never used the compost and it came back to life. Um, so yeah, this, this is what keeps me going just a bit of the natural world and, uh, you know, and, uh, some nice contact with, with my fellow humans. Did you grow up like that, Jeff? Were you, did you grow up in a family that was really big into the, into the environment and ecology and so forth? Uh, not at all. I grew up in, uh, just outside of Flint, Michigan. We were too poor to live in Flint <laughs> on a dirt street with my father was a single parent. Uh, yeah, we probably lived half a dozen to a dozen different places. I guess essentially we were homeless a lot of my childhood, except I wasn't aware, you know, we were living with relatives. And um, so, um, yeah, I grew up just over the fence from, um, the, the elementary school I went to was Buick Elementary. How many people went to a, <laughs> an over the fence uh, was the General Motors factory. Um, and it was the the terminus of a five mile long uh, manufacturing complex, which is at the time was the largest in the world. And even then in those days, even though we had a dirt street and um, you know, you turn the faucet on and sometimes the water would run, run brown and there were um, ponds, little ponds that like had fences around them that was some like acid mud stuff. And I kept thinking of these science fiction movies where somebody like, dissolves, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a very, um, there were woods around because it was the edge of this urban area, but it was very industrial. Um, you know, there were trains that go to sleep, the sound of trains clanking. And, uh, one day that school was cleared out. We all had to rush into the school actually, because there was a oil tank explosion, um, not far from us. So, um, and that's, you know, so I grew up in the, basically, one of the poorest parts of Flint. That's um, life. I also the... learned, um, the thing I'll never forget is we had a really strong sense of community uh, and, and a strong identity there. And in Bowling for Columbine, you see, that's the neighborhood where the little girl is shot by the little boy in Bowling for Columbine. And that's exactly where I grew up, uh, which is how I wound up helping. But you'll see this little thing that passes quickly where, you know, our track team won like, 10 state championships without even having a, a track. And since that time, they've went on to win many football and basketball championships. Not that sports is everything, but it's just a symbol of the, um, even with the poverty, you know, so many people have a stronger sense of community in poorer areas than we have in, you know, our rural areas or um, upscale white areas. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. I mean, what you're describing reminds me a lot of Northwest Indiana. I mean, we've got the steel mills. A lot of them have closed. There's coal ash ponds everywhere. There's just terrible ecological devastation, both from industrialization and then the deindustrialization process. So it's like that what you describe reminds me of a lot of stories of, you know, growing up in the Rust Belt, being in these industrialized areas. It's like this terrible catch 22, I think, for a lot of people where they came to this area, particularly black people in our area. You know, they migrated here from the South for these industrial jobs. And then most of those industrial jobs in our area have left. You know, we used to have like 120,000 union steel mill jobs stretching from the South side of Chicago to South Bend, Indiana. Now there's roughly 22,000 of those, you know, union steel worker jobs left. So this area has been ravaged by that deindustrialization the industrialization process, but then what it's left behind is super fun site after super fun site. 
um, you know, devastated streams and waterways, creeks, the lake. Um, so yeah, it reminds me of that sort of rust belt. What, what did you, what were you thinking by the time you became a teenager? You're, you're getting older now, you're becoming an adult. What, what was your, were you already politically interested? Were you like, maybe not with environmental stuff, but were there other things that you were involved with or what, what kind of got you into thinking about these issues? I think it was just the, the time we were in. I mean, I didn't, you know, my parents were, my mom was, you know, leaned. I think she voted for Nixon. Um, you know, she probably would have voted for Goldwater. I don't know if anybody remembers that, which is a, a whole different level. Of nightmare. <laughs> um, but, and uh, yeah, I, I think it was just being tuned into different things. First of all, the thing that tuned me into nature was, and I, once I worked with kids that were abused or, um, and, you know, um, had lots of issues. I found that no matter where you grew up, you had like a tree that you would climb in and just make it your own or a little spot in a field or a little abandoned spot in nature where there were flowers or maybe even under a bush when you were littler. Um, but that's helped keep, keep me going was just this, there were people around that, that did seem to, to care. And, you know, I could go off and just sit in nature, even in, in that urban environment. Um, so, you know, just, I mean, just, just the standard things for my generation really impacted me. Um, you know, having nightmares that nuclear bombs, the nuclear bomb had went off outside my window, literally jumping, uh, waking up in a cold sweat, um, watching the Cuban Missile Crisis unfold and realizing, you know, even at a small age that, um, you know, we, it could happen just like that. And then, I don't know why, as you see in the movie, when I was, you know, eight or nine years old, um, we had moved to an apartment building, um, moved in with um, my, my mother's friend, and they were this woods that I used to play in. I thought I was in heaven because there was this tall woods. And one day I came home from school and a bulldozer was knocking the woods down. And me and my cousins, we had a little bit of Rambo or something in us, uh, and we used to run wild through this this country area. And I thought, hmm, I got to put a stop to this. So I really did try and figure out how to block the trails and, you know, nothing was like that was going to work. And I really did wind up at the very end. It wound up parking near our um, apartment buildings and putting sand in, in the, what I thought was the gas tank could have been the oil. oil. I don't, I didn't know at that age, but I'm not recommending that kind of um, action, <laughs> but I was just so distraught. I couldn't believe that people were allowed to bulldoze down a forest. And uh, what's not in the movie is my mother explained to me, she said, well, they had to do the same thing for the apartments we're living in. And I kind of didn't want to accept that. It's like, oh. Um, so um, as a teenager, I was really into science, into physics, into science fiction. That was my life. And then, um, and then you know, my senior year of high school, we switched, I switched schools. I wound up meeting um, Michael Moore. And uh, that's when things kind of uh, took off. But I think something just sensitized me to even then, I had this feeling, this this industrial civilization, something's not quite right. This is just not how things are meant to be. I just didn't have an explanation for it. Um, and now I think maybe people like us that are from a place where the end of the world in some ways has already arrived. Um, you know, I used to call, after Katrina, I went down in the Gulf Coast and was thinking about making a documentary about what had happened after Katrina. And when I saw what happened to New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, I said, oh, this is just Flint in a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we've already been bombed out and shut down and poisoned and polluted and um, people desperate. Um, right. So I, I think there's something about being from industrial areas where there's been this decline that maybe allows us to feel differently about, uh, we can feel in our bones that the future of the civilization is not infinite. Or as you mentioned, we're already sort of seeing the end of it in places like this. Did you um, immediately get into filmmaking, Jeff? When you met Michael, oh, no. what kind of issues were you guys? So you're in high school. What were you doing? What kind of issues uh, were you involved with sort of through your 20s and so forth? And I'm only asking this sure. many background questions just to kind of humanize you. And, you know, because there's a lot of people yeah, out there right now who are, I think, interested and they look at some of this as I'm sure you've noticed over the years and they're like, I don't know if I can get involved. Is that for me? Is it not for me? So I think some of these personal stories right. help. Yeah, I think it's good. That's, that's, um, 
Yeah, it's it's so funny because I made the film because um, I'm terrified that um, that millions and then billions of people are going to suffer and die because we don't get it together. You know, I mean, we don't want to believe collapse can happen to our civilization, uh, but it's happened to every civilization. Uh, so we'd be basically the first that it didn't happen to. And with a global civilization, I think even those people who worry about such things are really underestimating what's going to happen in a, in a collapse. Um, so many different tripwires. Um, you know, and, but from the very beginning, um, you know, I, I was an environmentalist in terms of uh, we've got to, we've got to do something. This way of living isn't working out. We've got to try and uh, live a different way from the, from the very beginning. But my main work at that time was out of, out of love and concern for people. So we, Michael and I and some friends started this thing called the Davison Hotline. The, the school we graduated from was Davison High School. And so we actually got a uh, space um, at the local Catholic church and we got funding from, I think we got a little from the, even the VFW and the Chamber of Commerce and we got some state drug abuse funding. And we started this crisis line because we were really worried about, at that time it was drug overdoses, problem pregnancies, suicide, depression. Um, so we, we had like 40 volunteers. Um, so from there, I went on into social work at the same time I was studying, like, how do you grow your own food? How do you build a homestead? You know, what's, what might sustainable agriculture look like? I was studying humanistic psychology and, and uh, you know, social services. So I went on to work with a lot of troubled kids. We, I had a program where we took in the very um, most difficult kids that were going to either wind up in a mental institution or in prison. So this is like a last desperate place. Um, kids from the inner city, kids from rural areas, kids from all over Michigan. So I did that for a number of years and I only broke into filmmaking on accident when Bowling for Columbine came up and when Michael started filming in Michigan. That was the first film you worked on, Jeff? The first film I worked on. Yeah, I was just praying, please don't let me ruin my friend's film. <laughs> <laughs> what a cool experience. What was it, what yeah. was that like doing your first doing your first film, especially with a friend you've had for so long? Well, I worked out of Michigan, so Michael and I had intermittent contact during it. He was in New York. Uh, I happened to be in one production meeting when I was just visiting him, uh, but didn't have any idea of working on the film. Um, so I was basically living here, you know, just trying to switch to um, environmental writing uh, from social work. And uh, um, I was really worried about the trees dying at that time um, and why we weren't paying attention. So yeah, just one day um, they came to Michigan and they were in Flint doing some filming. And uh, Michael said, you know, do you think you can meet us in St. Helens where Charlton Heston's from um, in a couple hours? I'm like, okay. He said, and why don't you go, if you see if you can get there ahead of us and find where he grew up. Okay. And uh, the school he went to. All right. And uh, oh, where the buck pole is, you know, cause it was opening day of deer season. And uh, oh, here's five people that knew him. Um, I'm like, oh, okay. So I got my card. <laughs> Drove through snow, 120 miles to St. Helens. Um, just, I'm kind of a shy person, but when it, when I have a mission, you know, I'm less shy. So I just walked into the middle of this convenience store and said, "Does anybody here know anything about Charlton Heston?" <laughs> <laughs> and just out loud enough where several people could hear, and they said, "Well, go to the library. Um, there's a Charlton Heston thing there." So I went to the library, and it turned out that he had never donated to the library for some reason. So I don't know if that was a reason or whatever, but the librarian took this township map and put everything on the map. And then they happened to pull up and I just handed them the map. And I'm like, Oh, here's a van full of film people. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so I guess they were impressed because what are the chances of finding all this stuff as a, uh, you know, field producer, like in a half hour. Right. So then it's my reward was not getting in the van with them to join the filming, but they said, Michael said, well, why don't you go um, to the town where um, one of the Columbine shooters is from and see what you can find. And uh, I didn't find much because none of the adults wanted to talk about it, but I found those, the two boys you see in the movie working at a gas station, gun boy and bomb boy. Um, so, so I went 
to this bowling alley next to the gas station where they worked and uh, asked if we could film there. And um, so those first day found two things that made the movie and uh, I went on from there. So, but I was just basically living here, doing other things. And whenever something would come up, I would go on, uh, you know, try and set it up like uh, the famous um, bank that gives you a gun. You know, there was this big controversy for a while. Oh, you know, they didn't, they don't hand out guns there. You know, it's like, it's like, that was a setup. It's like, uh, they had th like three chances to cancel that. <laughs> they had a gun rack, a gun on the gun rack in the wall. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's the kind of thing I was doing. It was field producing and, uh, but, it, and then their, their deal with their composer fell through. So Michael knew I played a little bit of keyboards and drums. So I went to New York then for the first time and, um, did 10 or 15 original like little cues for the movie. And then I stuck around for the post-production and for some reason it just was, was like a natural thing. I'm sitting there in the sound mix uh, and there's nobody else there. And I, they're, they're like, see what you can do, you know, just sit there, give them a few thoughts. And so I, I'm giving him a little idea about how I think it should be mixed. And I said, well, wh what else did you mix? He says, well, uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I think. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, the, uh, okay. So, <laughs> but for some reason, I don't know why I was really comfortable with all that stuff right from the beginning. Um, and it seemed to work out. So. And then, so soon after Columbine, so you're thinking, I mean, when you're doing these kind of films, Jeff, do you think about that topic then forever afterward, or do you just ditch it? You're like, look, we got that out. I can't think about gun violence and, and, and guns and so forth. Like, this culture, what it means. I mean, is this stuff that you like try and get rid of right after that? Or is this stuff that just sticks mm, with you? That's a good question, Vince. I, somebody who was a hero of mine who wrote a book called The Dying of the Trees, I actually interviewed him for during this journey. And uh, the first person had the courage to say, what the hell is going wrong? Why are so many trees sick? And, um, but I was surprised when I got there because he had written that book and it really impacted me and helped, helped launch my journey. Because uh, he, he also had the courage to write about environmental despair, that maybe sometimes if you don't take care of yourself, you can get sick, actually, um, physically sick in a way that's hard to um, overcome. So, but he had moved on. That was just a book that he wrote and he was doing nature writing and um, that was probably a healthy move. But no, these issues, I only, aside from the part of being from Flint, I, I just... It, it just burned me up that why were all these guns in the inner city? Who was making money off of this? You know, when I was a kid, the inner city wasn't filled with guns. What the hell happened? You know, um, and, and you know, it, it never leaves me. All of these stories are just part of our lives. You know, um, and so I don't know what it would be like to make a movie that was just something you did and then you moved on. That makes sense. And then, well, soon after that, what was Columbine's, what, 96 or 97? 2002, really. Two, 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 yeah, after 9-11. And then by 2004, Fahrenheit 9-11 was out. So it was a, was a pretty big turnaround. When did it When did it happen, though, Jeff? I'm, I'm Columbine, was that in 2002? Oh, the Columbine itself. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, it's 99. Was it 90? Yeah. Yeah, because I was I was either in middle school or early in high school when that happened, and then um, I graduated high school in '02, and then end up in the Marine Corps. And of course, I I told you before we went on air that the film Fahrenheit 9/11 had quite an impact on sort of where I went with my life. Talk, can you talk to me a little bit about what was your thinking? For those who don't remember, you're going to recall this even better than I do. But if you weren't for the war, you were a terrorist sympathizer. You were not patriotic. You were like a traitor. I mean, I remember all of that getting thrown around in this in the post nine eleven era. It was to actually take a step out and say something during that era. Um, I give a lot of credit, even though we had the largest protests ever um, before a war. I mean, I give a lot of credit to people who did step out um, for saying those things because it was difficult at that time. I think people might forget that now. Yeah, it's easy to forget. It's a good reminder because you know, obviously, we're going through some. Uh, uh, we've had. You know, we had eight and a half million views approximately in our film in, 
you know, around five weeks, which is pretty phenomenal. But a lot of people are really pissed off, uh, powerful people that uh, the story got out there and, uh, you know, are trying to put a stop to it. And they're, they're, they seem pretty well organized. Um, so it's good to remember that, um, you know, Bowling for Columbine was very controversial. And uh, Michael's um, anti-war speech during the Oscars, um, there was there was basically crickets from the left and from Hollywood, you know, uh, standing up for him. Um, you know, um, oh, what's his name? The uh, There was one um, liberal um, commentator on MSNBC at that time, and um, he got fired. Phil Donahue. Uh, Phil Donahue, that's, that, thank you. Um, and so segue, you know, into to not that long after that, we're making Fahrenheit um, 9-11. We were actually uh, worried about people not able to be, being able to see into our office building in New York City. I mean, that's how frightening it was. And uh, uh, Michael got, you know, death threats. He had to have security. You know, he had actual threats on his life. Um, so it was a time when it was, um, yeah, it was not popular. And we, we have to remember most of the Democrats voted for the war. Um, we showed things in Fahrenheit that um, I remember, you know, there were even people on our own team that were like, where well, you can't do this, like showing, um, you know, the heavy metal music um, that people were listening to. And it's like, this is, we're not, we're not even commenting. This is just part of life. And to, to, to keep that out, um, to take that out. Um, so, yeah, it was a very, I remember that it was important to both to, per, to personalize people in this film. That was a very, to me, a humanizing part of um, the experience, but also to actually show, uh, I think it was so critical to show Iraqis living their normal lives. I don't know if you, that, that caught your attention, but I, we were so used to seeing, we are so used to seeing brown skinned people and people around the world, you know, just in tragic situations, we need to see them as real human beings. And I, to me, that was one of the most critical parts of the film. I agree. Um, so I don't know how that affected you or when you were watching that at the time. Well, uh, both of those affected me. One, you made me feel like an asshole with the music, which was the right thing to make me feel at the moment because I was sitting there reflecting on our first deployment. I'm like, what the hell are we doing? It, it, you know, listening. I mean, we were listening to Metallica and all this stuff, people getting jacked up to do these patrols and all of this. Of course, when you get there, the process of like training and the dehumanization of the Iraqis through boot camp and the school of infantry and all the rest, that's like inherent to the training. I mean, it's very hard to get 18 year olds to go fly 7,000 miles from home and murder people if they're people, um, which gets to a whole thing around how we view the environment. And I think we can get to that, but yeah, that part made me how do some, you do that turnaround Vince, if I might interrupt you, just, I'm just curious. Cause I've never heard the other side. I mean, what I know there were, um, veterans against the war that were in the film. Yeah. But wh how, what was that like for you? The transition? Yeah. It was pretty quick to be quite honest with you. It was like movie two weeks later, I'm in Kuwait. A week after that, we're in Al Anbar province, uh, bordering with Syria. We're in a town called, uh, Al Qaim right on the Euphrates river, just east of the Syrian border. And so we're in, the most violent region in Iraq at the time. Uh, the battle for Fallujah was going on as well in Ramadi. Um, it was quick, took a lot of crap while I was in. You know, I was starting to become vocal during the deployment. Why are we doing this? Why are we going on this patrol? Why are, you know, why are we not saying anything about the civilians who are being killed? Why are people taking it upon themselves to kill civilians? I mean, these are all things that I eventually went on to testify to Congress about in 2008 uh, during the Winter Soldier hearings. And I guess all I could say is that it was quick, but it was it was quick and empowering, but also painful. Empowering that I felt the sense of like, a better sense of values and what I stood for and how I wanted to interact with the world. It was probably cathartic in some ways to denounce what I had participated in, but it was also, um, you know, it, it was difficult because you're losing friends in your social network of people who, especially in the military, which is this very insular institution that if you decide to turn against it, you know, a lot of the people within that institution, they don't want anything to do with you. 
So that part was difficult. I think what got me through that was having extremely supportive parents and extremely supportive friends and a big social network of people to sort of catch me when I came home from that, from those experiences. I imagine it could be dangerous even, um, you know, uh, beginning to separate from uh, what you're supposed to um, be espousing, you know, at that time when you're still in the military. Yeah, they gave us, uh, my friend uh, Nick Epstein and I were pretty vocal the whole time and they would give us the worst uh, duties you can have, you know, so... Uh, worst positions in the convoys, worst uh, work duties, and you know, putting us in as dangerous of positions as they could. That was their way of sort of telling us to keep our mouths shut. You know, uh, one of my um, pieces of music for Fahrenheit because I did the music, uh, the original music as well. There's much, lots of music and besides mine, but uh, you know, will they ever trust us again? And that's you know, and everything to me, everything is done with love. Um, because even though we might seem like we're calling out, uh, you know, ourselves or, or the troops or the, the Bush administration or, you know, um, it's it's really um, a message of love. And that's that's the basis for this. It's uh, reality. You know, I, I think of my movie as reality therapy for humans. And <laughs> sometimes we all need that. And uh, um, but I remember the first dozen or so times as we were watching Bowling for Col Columbine over and over again, I just, I, you know, I was just choked up or crying every single time. And the, the same with Fahrenheit when the, um, we had our premieres, I was just, you know, everyone, I was devastated. People were devastated. But the thing that um, I remembered was that wherever we went, we, I've never, this has never happened before or since. It's, people were talking about the movie. You'd ride the train and people are talking about the movie. Um, go downtown and, you know, um, there were people lined up opening day for the film. Uh, it had been announced like, it's, I thought it was just hours earlier that they were going to move up the opening. And there were people lined up down the block. And they had signs and organizing things and people were selling things. And it was like, wow. So I remember when it came to Planet of the Humans thinking the most important thing is, and isn't, um, sometimes you'll see a movie that's really good, but you wind up not talking about it after the film. It's just like everything's kind of buttoned up. Um, I wanted to make a movie that uh, people would, would talk about. And I wasn't necessarily seeking controversy, but just that it brought up things and feelings and emotions that would give you something to discuss. And um, I often say it's more important to ask the right questions than it is to have the wrong, you know, the right answers because we have the wrong questions. We're just going to never, we're going to never get there. So that was my mission with this movie is, um, I know this might sound weird, but to me, Planet of the Humans is kind of like a trailer for all these dozens of things that we need to think about and explore further um, that you can't possibly put into one film. Um, so that's, that, that's kind of the bookend for me is, um, could this be something that people are discussing like they were Fahrenheit? So one of the one of the people, well, a couple things, and we can move backwards now because we're going to jump ahead. I, when Planet of the Humans came out, we had an uproar of people from Michigan City who were just happy as all hell, and I can tell you why. Because three years ago, uh, to the chagrin of my friend Sergio and other people who tried to talk me out of this. I'm a very stubborn person, Jeff. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. we had a call from a local organizer in East Chicago. He said, look, there's a young woman who would like to come here. She's with the Beyond Coal campaign. And I told her if she wants to come to Michigan City that she needs to get a hold of you and she needs to get a hold of the community organizers there. Now, I had never worked with Sierra Club. I had never worked with any of the big green organizations. I was already skeptical of them because of folks I had read in the past, my experience with large NGOs and social movement contexts and all the rest. Um, I didn't follow the advice of many of the people around me and said, you know what, we need to bring her here to Michigan City. We'll work with them. We'll get some good work done. Their stated goal at the time was to close the coal-fired power plant that we have here in Michigan City. So we thought that was a, a good goal. We wanted to do it. Within two or three years, they told us that they were going to do it 
Um, you know, they couldn't give us a day, couldn't give us a year. We kept asking them, working with the organizer, building connections. Long story short, this experience turned into a complete disaster for any number of reasons. Um, some of which were the personalities involved, but also just the whole structure. You know, we couldn't get answers from the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club was making decisions behind our back uh, with Nipsco, which is the the company who the power company here. Um, they eventually release without letting any of us know. They release a, a shutdown date of 2028, which wasn't negotiated with anyone, which none of us agreed to, which none of us were happy with. This blew apart the entire campaign. Long story short, everyone in Michigan City who has any sense of what happened absolutely loathes the Beyond Coal campaign and their experiences with big NGOs. Your movie comes out now. I think. The way that Sergio and I reacted to it, you know, we were very angry about the whole situation and, and we felt, I think, very, you know, betrayed and hurt by that. But also, um, I think there were a lot of local people who couldn't quite understand why we were angry or as angry as we were. Then they saw the film and we had dozens of people reach out to us and they're like, this was it. They're like, this explain." I mean, people who had already been asking what is the role of these large NGOs? Why are we not winning? Why do we keep losing? Why do all the environmental indicators keep getting worse? Not just climate change, but ecological devastation across the board, loss of species, loss of habitats, so on and so forth. Um, I can't really tell you how much it meant to have a film hmm. that put together not only the questions we were asking, the 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 sort of skepticism we have with the folks who just say hey just build you know if we just have solar this or windmills that'll solve everything and one of the person's work anyway i'll, I'll let you talk I'll, I'll i'll shut the hell up but one of the person's work who really had an influence on us i think is uh derek jensen's work and i got exposed to his work before the beyond coal campaign but you know had been thinking about these things throughout the years thinking about our relationship to the planet to the living world this idea of sort of human supremacism, us at the center of this universe, at the center of this planet, reminded me a lot of American exceptionalism, but on a different level or, you know, sort of the way you grow up in this country where it's like, we are the center of the universe and, you know, and then the amount of harm that does to people outside of that universe and people within it. Um, anyway, that's my story. Uh, quick story of why that, why that film meant so much to us. And I think to a lot of us who've had these experiences with the environmental movement it really did uh it was a hell of a film it is a hell of a film well thank you the um yeah you, well you, you're raising just all kinds of issues that um it's almost heresy to bring up uh, but um you know if this fantasy could be true that we could just put up enough windmills and you could just shut the coal plant down um if that dream was actually true unless we ended growth, we're, we're still going to wind up in the same position. You know, when we got uh, Ozzy Zenner, who's in the movie, talks about um, in his book, you know, when we got nuclear energy, his book, Green Illusions, we didn't um, get rid of coal and gas and oil. We just kept using it all. So this this growth machine. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's what you just described brings up so many things because they don't tell you that the, you're going to put up the wind turbines and you're going to build a natural gas plant because, uh, you know, in Michigan, let's just cite solar. I'm more familiar with that. You know, solar, forget the 8% efficiency versus 20% that they keep debating about, you know, how efficient are the solar panels. It doesn't matter if they were 100% efficient. They only actually produce in Michigan 14% of their maximum rated energy. So that you know, 86% roughly means that 86% of the time, because of cloudiness, because of night, because of dust, because snow, whatever. Um, in Michigan, we have this thing, maybe you have it too, called November, December, January, February, <laughs> March, where the, the days are short and it's cloudy most of the time. That's right. So, you know, that's the gap that means that you have to have these other power plants going. And so uh, this fantasy that you can just close. now. The, of course you want to close the coal plant, but it becomes a little bit of a deceit, a false promise that we're just going to switch everything over and run it on. Uh, and then you discover as in the movie that, um, 
you know, all these machines are made from industrial civilization. And that's what's so funny about the, the accusations of, um, um, that I don't care about, um, you know, people around the world or it's, it's, we have a new form of colonialism in the form of mining and it's just mining just seems like this simple little thing. It's, it's just huge. It's one of the top ways we're destroying the planet. Um, in one of the, um, South American countries where the Amazon is located, I forget which one, um, the majority of their destruction of the, the rainforest is from mining. Overall, I think it's around 10%. Uh, and it's, and so if you start to look how, where the steel comes from, um, you know, and where the iron is mined in, in Brazil and where the lithium comes from and where the cobalt comes from and the aluminum comes from, you begin to see all these horrendous environmental impacts, but you see all these Southern hemisphere versions of colonialism um, that are very damaging to people in the environment and are not sustainable because anybody that's lived in a mining area, I've lived way in the North near the, the old um, iron and copper mines in Northern Michigan. There's huge areas that in this, that are just abandoned um, and will be for a long time. You can't drink the water, the ground's caving in. There's landscapes that are devastated that you're roped off from. So um, you begin to realize it's not the bargain that they advertised. Um, but then there's this whole other level of issues and I, which I've never, I've never talked about this before. I was thinking about putting it in my own podcast or in a, a future episode of, of Planet of the Humans, wherever we go from here, either the, another film or a series. Um, but, oh, this is probably in the nineties. And I was trying to get in touch with what was going on with the environmental movement. And I, I kept seeing these events that would happen, you know, on TV or on the internet. And I'm like, how come I never hear about these meetings? You would just see these, you know, conference on this and that, you know, this was even back in, uh, Clinton Gore. I'm like, dang, I can never find out when these things are, they just happen. And then I began to, so, okay. Um, how can I go to a Sierra Club national meeting to have input? I'm like searching, searching, searching. It's like it doesn't come up. Hmm. How can I go to a Greenpeace national meeting to find out what they're talking about and make plans? Search, search, search. It doesn't come up. How about 350.org? How about NRDC? And unless something's drastically changed in a few years, you realize when they mean join, they mean send a check. When they mean join, they mean come to their protest or come to their campaign that they've already decided that's been funded by, you know, a billionaire or by a, a foundation. So I, I, I just like got this really weird feeling. It's like, wow, this environmental movement is not, I don't know what the word is, but it's a little bit like the military structure, right? Is you, you got to play your role and they, they talk about it being grassroots, but it's really, um, th that just struck me as a sign of something um, so with, with the beyond coal campaign, sure. We want to close the coal plants, but your chance to, 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 to actually partner and be part of that story and part of that journey and to have a say, should we be honest about what that means? Should we be honest about what the alternatives are? You don't get a chance to participate in that. You just are the downstream recipient of what they decide. And I saw that in the peace movement too. It's like, because of my connection with Fahrenheit 9-11 and, and I was able to to, to go to a meeting where the next big protest was being planned. I'm like, that is so weird that these like 12 people are sitting around this table planning the next protest, representing these groups. It's like, there's never a call, you know, for discussion about that. So even the peace movement, I started to think, is this really an anti-war movement? Is this really a stop the war movement? Or is it a movement for all of us to check a little box? We had this protest and we did this. Uh, and I think the Beyond Coal campaign, what, I'm sure there's many well-intentioned people and good people that have been part of it, but once you're part of a system, it becomes about checking these little boxes. Sure. And I don't know if you felt that during your campaign. I felt that uh, not just during Beyond Coal, Jeff, but during the anti-war years. By the time I was working with the Iraq veterans against the war, <clears throat> after several years, it ends up you're holding events to get the proper photographs, to send the email to the proper donors, so you can get the next grant or the next funds to keep this staff member employed because this staff member has been there now for two or three years. Everybody's friends. We think we're doing the right thing, but also within that NGO structure, 
there was, I remember at a moment, okay, so I'll just tell this story real quick. I, I remember the moment when Barack Obama started to suck up a lot of that energy. I remember in 2007, 2008, a lot of the people I was working with in the anti-war movement were like, hey, look, we've got a candidate now who's anti-war. You know, we're going to start working with, with this, with this candidate. Leaving aside whether that was true or not, obviously, I think history shows that it was untrue that Obama was an anti-war candidate. All that aside, I remember sitting there going and at these meetings, and at the time I was sitting on the board of directors, and I remember setting, saying to folks, hey, shouldn't we call our donors and have the kind of honest conversations we have at these meetings? Like, shouldn't we actually tell them what we're saying, which was, where do we go from here? There's not as much energy around anti-war stuff now that Obama's been elected. We're not sure what our mission looks like now. We're trying to make changes. All the re- like they were like, "No, no, 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 no. Tell them we have a big event coming up in a couple months and that if they send their check, it'll allow us to do this, this and this." But none of that ever addressed like any of the underlying issues or the fact that we wanted to stop the war. It was like once we were in this NGO machine, that machine needed to keep going. And that meant grants and funding and calling donors. And in order to solicit money from them, you had to perform actions, no matter how symbolic or useless those actions might've been. You just had to keep doing them just to keep showing people that you were doing something just so they could feel good about sending you the check. I don't mean to make that too simplistic, but that was quite literally my experience with uh, NGOs, both in the anti-war movement and in the environmental movement. I had the same experience in social work. People would do what was fundable and what was snappy um, to try and make change in the community in terms of health prevention. And I'm like, this is going to be completely ineffective. One, you know, uh, somebody came up with the idea, oh, look, we're going to have, you know, to try and uh, reduce teen pregnancies, we're going to have sex can wait shoelaces and sex can wait sunglasses. (laughs) And we were going to get this grant from a certain foundation. I'm like, have you never studied sociology or psychology? Do you know that you can't put shoelaces like that in a uh, middle school without making them think about sex? <laughs> and I just, that's about when I started to transition out of uh, human services. It's like, wow, this is really driven, not by measuring impact, by measuring what's going to fill out the little box. And um, this, we're talking about, I think th- this awareness and this airing out is really healthy. And maybe we'll come back and have a show and we can talk about you know, where we're going, things are going to go in the future. But I think this is an important period we're in where we're, um, you know, assessing why we've been losing. I think it's really important to look at why we've been losing. Um, one of the things I learned early on in making this film is I went out and talked to um, forest activists who had um, risked their lives, who had um, had campaigns that succeeded in, in saving forests, old growth forests in the Pacific Northwest. And the, the first thing they told me was that things were never worse than under Clinton Gore in terms of logging. Why would that be? Because people assumed they were environmentalists. They assumed that they were Democrats were on our side. And so the kind of, they were, they were able to get away with more uh, during that period. There was also a big push under Clinton Gore is when the whole push for environmental groups not to fight logging or to fight things came up, but to collaborate, which I'm a peaceful, peaceful person. That makes sense in a certain way, but in another way, you know, they took the money from anybody actually fighting deforestation and logging, and gave it to those who began to compromise. Um, so, I guess you need to compromise at some point. But what I've learned in activism is that you have, if you don't start with a strong position, we are going to close this coal plant. We are not going to have this biomass plant. You know. Um, you're going to lose if you're pre-compromised. Um, and then, according to the forest activists, um, and then th- the actual groups would step in. The formal f- groups would step in and take credit for having for any success that they had. Um, but and another saying that one of them gave me, um, one of the guys who lost his funding, and it's it's uh, he's man, it was just really a sad story because he his policy was zero cut. You know, he didn't want um, he was just going to oppose logging. That's what his, so he wound up losing his funding. Uh, but he said, you know, all of our, uh, our defeats are permanent. Our victories are, are temporary talking about fighting logging. And that stuck with me. And I don't think that has to be, but in the context of this 
perpetual growth in this machine that just keeps expanding and expanding, whether it's in the name of fossil fuels, in the name of nuclear power, in the name of um, you know more clean energy. Um, we should stop calling it clean energy. There's gotta be some other word. Um, it's, it's energy that exports the damage somewhere. We, we don't feel it, it happens to other people. Um, but you know, that our victories are temporary because as the human or all of our human needs and industrialism keeps expanding, it just, it's, it's gonna, it needs more and more and more. So um, that's, but you know, and the other thing I like to do is, which maybe we can do in a future time is, you know, just think about where people have succeeded because people have stopped things. And, you know, I'd like to even, you know, for, for the next movie or for the, for the series, be th thinking about, you know, what cultures have actually successfully navigated this territory? Have any? Uh, there were cultures that were sustainable for, um, for a long time until they got destabilized. You know, what can we learn from them? Um, but this, this global civilization, uh, this global industrial civilization that's expanding and expanding without bounds, uh, this has never happened before in the history of the planet. Um, and that's really, you know, not to meander, but that's really another reason I made the film is to begin to see ourselves, um, even though some sure, sure parts of our culture are more to blame industrialism and capitalism, but the frame of seeing ourselves as a single species that's taken over an entire planet. Um, and whether that even in theory could be sustainable for us to dominate every ecosystem on earth. Um, I happen to not think so, but it's a question that we don't even ask. When did you ask, when can you pinpoint when you really started to ask that question? I mean, that seems a lot deeper, you know, in other words, I think we all go through these processes where you go, Hey, we've got to do something. We're fighting a war for oil and that's connected to climate change and that's ecological, but that's way different, not way different. It might lead one, but it doesn't lead everyone to ask the question. What is our place in the society questioning industrial civilization understanding that civilizations have collapsed in the past, that ours looks in fact, like we're on that uh, well on that route. Um, and then this question of human beings being at the center of everything, those are deep, profound questions. It's a lot deeper than simply recognizing that wars for oil are connected to climate change, for instance. I mean, can you sort of pinpoint when you made that transition or when you started to ask those yeah, questions? I, I can, I don't know what triggered it exactly. Um, I think I was even not that, that aware of the trees for some reason in the late nineties, I, I think it was the availability of the internet. I started to ask a question that maybe I've had my whole life, which was, um, you know, how are we going to know when things fall apart? What are the signs when things fall apart? And I began to notice that all the science fiction movies, they usually go from everything's normal. Everything's normal. Everything's normal something happens and now you're in Mad Max world, you know, or it starts out like the road. Have you ever seen the road? Yep. I, I recommend that movie, the road. Um, it's, you know, it's normal world. The couple's in their apartment. There's some noises. There's some sounds. There's a fire. He starts to fill up the bathtub with water, which is very interesting because Chris Hedges, um, mm -hmm. I asked him, you know, having him having lived in a war zone, what's the first thing that goes? He says, you come home and there's no water in the tap. I'm like no water in the tap. Yeah, there's no water. It's <laughs> like water. People die getting water in a in a in a war zone, right? Yeah. So, in the road when he's filling up the bathtub, um, she says, "What are you doing?" And of course, he's realizing that it's going to fall apart, and you and the water is going to go. So, and then the next thing you see, it's this completely dead world. So, I I just began to notice that it seemed like there was this blind spot where nobody was really gaming, mapping out, you know, laying out exactly step by step. And so as I noticed the trees were dying, maybe that was one of the first little things I'm like, could this be one of the signs that we weren't even expecting, like a bunch of trees dying? Um, and I just started searching the internet and found, I, and still to this day, I don't know that anybody, some people disagree. I don't think anybody's done the definitive, like here's how it's going to go down people, civilizationally and environmentally. Like, We've heard of pandemics, but who could have picture how it would actually shake out? And when when does the, the next pandemic come? And then Ebola also rises, or 
when there's not enough people to keep the nuclear power plants running or an eye on them, um, you know, or when the algae blooms that are toxic, you know, I think there's so many tripwires we're not aware of when the fresh food that we're all stops being shipped in, um, you know, and even what's happening right now with um, the concern about racial justice and the way um, the gap between um, the people where I grew up in Flint, and, you know, and, and in uh, Minneapolis and all around the country. Um, I know money isn't everything, but what I just saw a statistic where white families have 10 times more wealth yeah. than black families. And the violence, I think Trump is a symptom of civilizational collapse and his urge for violence. I think the right is actually suicidal. Yeah. I th and so the tripwires of people can't take it anymore. That's what we're seeing. You know, the injustice of um, the disparity is just so cruel and evil. And on top of that, the direct violence um, being done to black men and women in this country. So I think there are cultural tripwires. Uh, what if, what if uh, Trump, Trump's uh, crazy people with guns actually took him seriously? Um, you know, these, so that's what I'm worried about is um, only during a time like this, when we sort of somewhat have it together, could we actually map out a gentle landing for the environment and for all the people, especially those who are not being well taken care of now. Um, and if, if you say what my mission is, it's for to have a gentle landing because um, I may disagree with some others that say, think we can just push the system over because unfortunately, given our level of population and consumption, um, how, how many years ago was it when Greece had the big economic crisis? About 10 years ago? About 10 years, yeah. You know, so as fossil fuels became too expensive, people started running out and cutting down the forest. And I think Athens or another major city I became remember that. almost unbreathable. Yep, because of the burning the firewood. So yep. So I re actually am a big believer in shutting these things down, but doing it in a gentle curve way that allows humans and the environment to survive into a new future. I also worry about that. I mean, even right now, so for instance... We, on the positive side, we see ton of people right now engaged at a level that we've never seen before and a, and a sense of resilience and militancy that we've never seen before. That can both be good and bad. So far, I think we've seen it used mostly in good ways and just the response that's happened so far. I just read a poll in Newsweek, 52% of Americans agree, uh, even with the the rioting and the looting. I mean, that is, that's a profound difference than wow. what we experienced in uh, 2014 when we came back from Ferguson. We traveled down there with Black Lives Matter organizers from Gary, Indiana. And so I think, you know, Sergio's from the former Soviet Union. Sergio's family's from Ukraine. Um, he talks a lot about collapse and what that looks like, the signs of it, the experience of it we both lived in a society that was destroyed and then of course collapsed for a short amount of time being in Iraq. And here, two things, one thing you brought up, we always talk about is nuclear power plants. What do you do with them? How do you manage them? In other words, I think there is a simplistic view on the left that you can just kind of toss this whole thing over and that would be much better than what we have now. Um, I worry about nuclear power plants more so than that. I worry about nuclear weapons. I worry about the fact that there's 9,000 nuclear warheads in this country. Who controls those military bases? Who makes those decisions? Who they're accountable to? How they're disposed of? Those are all serious questions. Um, I read, it's not the best book in the world, but I, I read years ago Ted Koppel's book called Lights Out. It's about the, the susceptibility of like the electrical grid in the United States um, to cyber attacks and so forth. And the CIA did a study and it showed that if the, if east of the Mississippi were out of power for a year, that nine out of 10 Americans would be dead within two years. So we don't want that. Um, so, you know, it's like 
we're trying to think, you know, Sergio and I are not interested in this, like in this posturing, like, oh, we're revolutionary leftists. I mean, some of our friends we call comrades because that's how they refer to themselves. You know, some of our friends we call brother and sister because they're union cats and that's how they refer. We're interested in getting this work done. We understand, I think, the severity of the issues. Um, I think we also understand that there needs to be radical changes, but we don't want to just say simplistic things to people. And I think that's one of the reasons why we both appreciated the movie so much, which is that one thing I've learned in 15 years of doing this work, which isn't that long, but long enough to learn some lessons, and that is there are no easy answers. So whenever I meet someone who's an activist or a thinker, or a filmmaker, or a writer, and they say, oh, it's really simple. You just do this. My skeptical eye starts, I start saying, wait a minute, I haven't met anybody in 15 years that's ever told me that any of this is easy. So I appreciate that as well. And, um, well, I guess one of the things I did want to ask you too, because I don't want, I know we're probably already over time with you, but did you expect this kind of a pushback? Cause I don't, I don't want, I know you've done other interviews where you've talked about really getting in depth in the film and the, and the claims made in the film and the critiques of the film. I'm not really so much interested in those details in this interview. I'm really interested in sort of your sense of, did you expect this kind of pushback one? And then two, if you could kind of bring folks up to speed as to what's happening with the film right now, how they can view it, if they can view it at all and what we all need to do to make sure that we fight this, uh, censoring the censorship. Sure. Um, no, I didn't expect, I guess I expected um, pushback, but I, I did not expect, which was maybe a little naive when I think about it, but I didn't expect a level of um, lying and abuse and, um, you know, mean-spiritedness. I guess I thought that it would be more uh, a debate. I, de I never expected to be, you know, we submitted a, uh, I, immediately after the uh, one of the attacks, I in the Guardian, I uh, within days wrote a response. They 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 didn't even acknowledge that I'd sent it in, but I know that they got it because Newsweek Japan called and said, "Oh, do you, uh, I sent one into Newsweek as well uh, to respond to their attack, and nothing um, except Newsweek Japan, you know, alerted me that they had gotten it and they wanted to know about running it. I don't know if they did." Uh, the Guardian didn't respond. Um, a, many, a lot of the, the very um, standard leftist websites have like not published our response. I'm like, wow, that's bizarre. Um, I just think it's a testimony, you know, if I may say so, to the power of the film um, and to how much they're threatened by the millions of people that have seen it. And if you move away from the social media stuff that their people are pummeling, you know, the comments... Uh, the, the, the reaction, if you filter through that, has been very, very positive. Um, so I guess I didn't expect the cruelty um, and the, the censorship um, part of it. I just didn't anticipate that. Um, you know, but the thing that does make sense is this is not a movie about energy. It's a movie about um, to, to try and rip away the story, pull away the blinders uh, that this somehow this green miracle is going to save us from collapse. And even if everything they say is true, it's not going to save us from collapse. And I think the sooner we can accept, accept that we're in the time of collapse, one thing Chris has just said to me, and you can confirm if this is correct, is that, you know, the other thing that can be true in war zones is that you never can feel, there's a sense of mission and purpose and aliveness that, can cut, that everything's crystal clear. And you have a deep investment in reality to survive. And if you're not invested in reality, you're probably not going to make it yep. or, or far less likely to make it. So, um, but I think that's the, the stride we can hit once we, as a individuals and as a culture, accept the collapse is real. We, now we, be, we can begin to plan for it. Let's plan for, a, uh, use resources that we have to build a train system that can last a, a thousand years to get us through this bottleneck. If we're going to have any trains at all, let's begin to think, invest, explore, you know, how would you keep water going to a place like Flint or when collapse comes to Minneapolis or to Traverse City, Michigan, you know, where I live, how are we going to plan for a different future? Now that that's becomes exciting and something for us to do and to focus on. Um, but first we, 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 we have to dispense with the story of green capitalism and, and green energy going to save us and move into the full light of reality 
Um, and I think we'll all be in this far better place because I actually think we're a bit neurotic and crazy living in denial. As far as the movie, um, um, I don't know when this will, um, we hope to have the movie up in the next few days and check uh, on our website and you'll see how that's going to transpire. Um, Excellent. So in fact, that's what we're working on right now as we speak. So uh, that's Excellent. one of the reasons I have to run, but, um, but it's, it's been great to talk to you and I'm, re, you know, I enjoy, I, I learn as I talk, but I also learn as I listen and thank you for sharing. And uh, I can't wait to have, spend more time together and uh, to continue to discover this and, and to learn more about this future that we haven't really thought enough about, like what is, what are the tripwires? What do we need to be concerned about? What kind of plan do we need to make for humans uh, that we all love and for the, the non-human species that we all love to both survive? I agree. And that's, thrive, not just survive, but thrive. That's a great way to end, Jeff. You're uh, you're a fun person to talk to. You're very thoughtful and you've got a, a, a had a lot of hell, a hell of an experience in the, the movies that you've been a part of making have in my opinion, been some of the most important documentaries of my lifetime. So they really, uh, I think, shaped the way a lot of us um, have developed over the years. Documentaries are, you know, they're very important, very powerful. So thank you for your work, Jeff, and is is really, really a pleasure to speak with you. Thank Thanks you, for ben, taking your thanks. time. Thank you. And I think, you know, it's, uh, as long as we're all doing it, remembering, you know, however vehement we have to be or strident or you know, direct, it's all based on love. And that's the, if we just, if that's the basis for what we do, then I think we're on the right path. Thank you for that reminder. All right, Thank Jeff, you. have a good one, man. Bye. Take care. You've been watching Park Media. I'm your host, Vince Emanuele, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.